you're the church. You know that? I know we know that. But we don't really know it. We think we're like bit part players. We think we're the, the people in the stands in the football game and there's a few people running around on the pitch as a team, but you're the team. You know, just part of the club, you're the team. Your life matters. The Lord has need of you. I love that sort of story when Jesus sends his disciples to go and get a donkey and, you know, says, if anyone asks, say the Lord has need of it. doesn't matter whether you feel like a donkey. The Lord has need of you this morning. He has a purpose for your life. And we, we don't posture what God wants to do by simply cheering on those people that we see stepping out. God needs us all to step out. And it's been a real joy over past months to see many people knowing the brooding of the Holy Spirit, the challenge of the Spirit about their lives, about how they interact with their workplace, how they interact with their families, how they interact with a whole host of the things that are around their life, even their finances, just talking to someone last week and they're saying that they're stepping out of the boat and they, they're going to start test, test, testing God really and trusting God in terms of their giving and tithing. And, and that there was just almost tears in their eyes as they were telling me this. So they're going to really step out. And, and there's just such a sense of the Lord speaking to so many people right now. And... I, I, I want you to know I'm in the trenches with you. Together, we believe that God is doing something in these days. And I can't think of a better manual for us to walk through this season of what we're doing than the book of Acts. It's a book that I've been living with for quite a number of months now in, in a more intentional, intense way. And there is just such a richness in this book that I believe is so significant for this season that we're in. And it's important when we look at the book of Acts that we remember that most of the things we read had never happened before. Yeah. That there weren't conferences or mentors they could speak to. There weren't people that they could pick up the phone to or Google or ask chat GBT what they do in that situation. You know, There was just no reference points. They had to rely on the Spirit. They had to. There was no other alternative. And we're on Acts 3. We've got a long way to go through this book. But Acts 3, verse 1 to 10, it says these words. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I give you, in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then, taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and he started to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg, at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. This comes after the last chapter which introduced us to the results or the impact of a spirit-filled church. We see that they were full of the activity of God. There was this regular reference to awe in the community, wonder, the fear of the Lord present. The sense of I don't want anything to happen in my life that is going to put him off feeling comfortable with me. That's the benchmark of our relationship with the Lord. It's not what are the rules. It's 
the person that's with me, will he feel at home with me thinking this, saying this, or doing this? Or will he feel like he's not welcome? That's the, that's the journey. And the Spirit comes to help teach us how to live our lives orientated to that desire to please him in everything. So when the fear of the Lord comes on a community, there is that greater awareness that we are in the presence, not just of one another, but in the presence of God. See, our words are so easy to pour out of our mouths, aren't they? It's so easy for us to critique people, to say things that are derogatory. And some of that gets massaged into humor. Some of that gets put into cynicism. Some of that just gets put into prayer requests. All sorts of manner of things can come out of our mouths that essentially are things that are not building others up, but they're pulling them down. And God has a thought about that. And he just steps away from the conversation. I want to encourage you this week to think about all your conversations, not just in church environments, but in every environment, and think, is Jesus coming close to this one, or is he stepping back? Because he wants to step close, and when he's close, that's when we have access to his accompaniment into every area of our life. That's when we know that the one that is with us is greater than anyone that's against us or any problem that we face. And we're about to see this with Peter and John. It was a spirit-filled church. It was a growing church. It was a generous church. And we read about this awe, these signs and wonders we read at the end of chapter 2 that were performed. We're not told what those signs and wonders are, but until this story where we see the first real demonstration in the book of Acts. Of course, there had been many miracles. There had been thousands of people saved in a day. There were people being added to the number daily. We read that there were signs and wonders happening. But this is the first one that the author of this book, Luke, captured in words. The man, the layman, at the gate, beautiful. Now, there's something that's important for us to understand. First of all, we read this lame man was lame from birth. He had never known anything different. You think about the miracle that's about to happen. He'd never walked, ever. It wasn't just strength. It was learning the techniques of walking. This is incredible. What was about to happen in this man's life? was beyond any frame of reference. This wasn't restore my ability to walk. This was such a significant miracle. But when you were lame in these times or had many other disabilities, it is likely that this man and others in a similar situation would have experienced discrimination of some sort. Do I need to use another mic? Yes. Okay. One of the challenges our sound guys face is all the fans in the room, that they move things around, and I think they do make a difference to the sound. Thank you guys for working that out. When someone had a disability, they were likely to experience significant discrimination in their society. They'd be left out of things. They would miss out on opportunities. And although the Old Testament called for the people of God to give just treatment, just lower the volume, guys. I'll shout if I have to. Let's, let's not have this feedback. Although in the Old Testament we read that God called for just treatment of people who had disabilities, the reality was in society that the practice was far from that. Some commentators even noted that around this time that there would have been those that when they saw someone who was lame, that they would have said these words, 
Blessed be the righteous judge. And it was a bit like, you deserve this. He's righteous, he's a judge, and he's judged that you don't deserve the use of your body in the way that others do. There was a lot of unkindness around. And of course, there was no state system, there was no um, disability allowance, there were, there were no uh, the provisions, there was no safety net in the society. The only safety net we read that this guy had is he managed to get a few people to help him get to the temple gate. I don't know whether he paid them. I don't know whether they were friends, whether they were family, but he managed to get help every day to go to this gate called Beautiful. And of course, there, there will be people going back and forth to the temple, and those people would feel, some of them, that their conscience was pinged and they would help this guy be able to get through the day, this marginalized individual, just enough to sustain him for one more day. Not much of an existence, not much of a reality. Just a few months previously, I suspect, because we read that this, this man was like this since birth, and that every day he was taken to the temple gate, I suspect that Jesus maybe even walked past him. That he would have seen him. He would have heard the, the hustle and the bustle of the crowd and seen lots of people following and hear the rumors and the stories and people shouting. Stories of healings and yet nothing for him. I'm sure that would have been something of a buzz around that he would have overheard about this man from Nazareth, Nazareth who was healing people. But here he sits. His best hope was to raise enough money through the charity of others for one more day's survival. And then enters Peter and John. Now we read something about the, the church that they were meeting in homes. They were breaking bread in taking communion people's homes. They were gathering in small groups. Um, some of those homes have been quite large. They're probably the most affluent of people. Their home would have catered for no more than 50. So, you know, there were various size groups. But also, we read that every day they prayed in the temple. They gathered. They knew that there was a sense of coming together. And we believe here, we discover that our life is richer when we're part of a big and a small community. We believe that there are things that are better in small community. We get a greater sense of uh, of getting to know each other, of knowing the journey that one another's on, of standing together because we understand where everyone's at. In our prayers, there can be a real faith-filled sense of prayer that comes by knowing people's stories. But that if that's the only sort of connection or community you have, then the sense of being quite isolated in our community and the sense of being, um, you know, not part of something that God's doing on a big scale can get lost. And we believe it's helpful to be part of a big community. Because there's nothing quite like worshiping together in this environment, is there? There's nothing quite like standing together with hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people, lifting our voices in adoration and sensing the presence of God together. That's precious. That's special. And so in the early church, they had small and they had big. And Jesus, who had changed everything for these followers of Jesus, he had set the template about how they lived and how they live their life in, in relation to others. And here is Peter and John, and they see this man asking for some money. Now, the context of life in the early church may have looked a bit different to us today. I don't know whether they had some of the plagues of our society today. I don't know if they had consumerism on the same scale. I don't know if they were queuing up outside for the latest gadgets and device. I don't know whether they were thrown um, with special offers everywhere for credit that would enable them to buy today and pay for the rest of their lives. I don't know if those things were pressures around them, but I do know that there are some things that are fairly consistent throughout the generations. There are something, and something has been captured by um, uh, psychotherapist Maslow, that he talks about the hierarchy of need that there is in people's lives, and these have been consistent through the ages. I'd like you to look at them for a moment with me. Uh, it should be on the screen any moment. There you are. 
So start here with a psychological need, the need for life to feed, to water, shelter, clothing, sleep, those essential blocks of our physical self that this man was asking for help with that need. But then there are other needs that we have. That's not, that doesn't satisfy and fill our lives. It never has done throughout history. There's safety and security, health, employment, property, family, social ability. These are things that they um, surround everyone in our lives. And I'm sure that this man would have loved to have been well, but that wasn't his request. It was simply to meet some of his physical needs. But of course, safety and security don't answer all of our needs in our life. There's love and belonging. We want friendship, family, intimacy, a sense of connection, a sense of belonging. And if you don't have a sense of connection and belonging, can I encourage you to maybe reframe how you engage with those around you in order to fix that? Because hands up, everyone who's a nice person here. Would you put your hands up if you're a nice person? Oh, crying out loud. We've got, we've got like 20% of the church who are nice, apparently. Okay, put your hand up if you're a horrible person. No, no, you're not. I know you. You're not. Lord, heal them. Deliver them of that untruth. You are nice people. And why do we get concerned about stepping out of our comfort zone and saying, hello, my name is Mark. What's your name? Tell me a little bit about your journey and about your life. Learn to ask questions. Because in the mystery and the intrigue of asking questions, we begin to see other people's lives, and then we go deeper and we begin to see their hearts, and that's when we begin to connect. I, I have to tell you that church cannot make you have friends. Just because you come into a large group or just because you belong to a life group we cannot make you have friends. And I know loneliness is an epidemic in today's world. But loneliness is when it is attended to. When there's more than one person, they get together and they dance relationally in this world. And you cannot have a successful dance with one person having all the moves and the other person being dragged around the floor. It doesn't work that way. We have to all choose to dance relationally, to make connections. And I want to encourage you. You're a lovely person. You're a child of God. You've got things in your life that no one else has that you can bless other people with. And other people around you have the same. Step out. Find love and belonging. And don't just keep expecting other people to fix that for you. But sometimes we don't do it because of the next one, the self-esteem bit, eh? Our confidence. We love to have a sense of confidence about our life, achievement, respect of others, the needs to be a unique individual. And then Maslow called it self-actualization, our morality, our creativity, spontaneity, acceptance, experience, purpose in our life. No, our inner potential being released. Society. And this is just one man. This is just one man's impression from his understanding of studying, um, you know, psychotherapy and so on. So this is not the gospel. But maybe you can look in your life and you see a multitude of needs. These are needs that many have observed are fairly common to mankind. And although society may be different thousands of years later to what it was in the New Testament time, there is a lot of commonality with these needs. And these needs, they can motivate and they can drive us to make decisions. And every generation makes those decisions in different ways, but they make them for the same reasons. Do you know these needs, there are advertisers that are striving to manipulate your desire to get these needs met in order to get you to make decisions that are unhealthy for you. Do you know governments are, help, are desiring to prove to you that they can help 
you satisfy these needs better in your life, that you need them in order to do that. Whatever they will, it looks like we're going to probably have an election in the next year or so, but you know, whenever they bring out their manifestos, if you put them next to these needs, you'll see what they're trying to do is to minister to the depths of what's being craved for in our lives. You can spend the rest of your days putting your hope in your own striving to find a way to address these needs in your life. You can put your hope in yourself, in your skills. You can put your hope in service providers, in manufacturers. You can put your hope in education. You can put your hope in politics. But I want to tell you this morning that the only real hope you can have is found in Jesus. There is no other that is able to attend the fullness of the needs in your life and my life other than Jesus. The early church, they met daily because they knew that the only one who could meet their needs was Jesus. It could not just be words. It could not be a song that I surrender all. It had to be an action. And I think we've sold ourselves a bit short in today's world. I remember a number of years ago, and I, I make no criticism of any decisions other churches make. I'm sure they make them prayerfully before God. But there was a, a church that decided they were going to cancel their Sunday morning meetings for a period of time for them to go and love on their community. Litter pick, paint walls, do gardens, all that sort of stuff. Now, those things are really good things to do. And they're things that bless our communities and can reveal Christ. But I remember somebody asking whether another minister thought that was a good idea. And the other minister, his answer, I remember, stuck with me to today. He said, you get one moment in the week where you gather everybody together. And you cancel that one moment to bless your community. What about all the other moments people had? What about the hours they spend on Netflix? What about, what about the hobbies they've got? Why, if Jesus is Lord, what about all those other things at least being put aside for one moment in order to bless your community? Why is it we've gone for the one thing? Are we that rationed? Are we that limited? Now, I know life is busy today. And I know that some people, because the way the world has ministered, that you are working more hours than you should in order to get more money than you need in order to pay bills for things that you've bought previously that you've taken credit for. Because the advertisers have got you. And this stuff I believe God really cares about. This is the stuff that's unpacking our discipleship, our journey of following Jesus and saying, we want to get this right with you, God. Because all of us have inherited a model where we gather together for an hour and a half or an hour and three quarters or two hours or by the time we get to the end of this, four hours. Um, you, we've all inherited some sort of model that that's what church is. And it's not. It's the people of God selling their lives out before him, surrendering everything before him and saying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you are my obsession, Jesus. See, in the New Testament, they knew that he wasn't just the promised Messiah, but he was the revelation of the answer to every question, every desire, every hope that they had in their life. And they prayed in a similar way to how people eat regularly. They knew just in the same way as if they go for a few hours without food, their body begins to tell them, hey, I feel like I need some energy here. And their spirit is so attuned to the magnificence of God's ability to meet all of our needs that they made a decision that they were going to pray regularly. Their whole being needed fellowship with God and others to satisfy the longing in their lives. Salvation wasn't an encounter with Jesus, but it was a lifetime of Jesus' encounters. There are good places to be in your life. One is on the way to prayer. Two is in the place of prayer. And three is on the way from prayer. Those are the three best places you can live in your life. And Peter and John, they were on the way 
to prayer. And they encountered the lame beggar. Daring to believe that he would meet enough people that day with some charity in them in order to meet the first of Maslow's hierarchy of need. His physiological needs. His desire for food, water, shelter, clothing, and sleep. That was as high as his hope would allow him to dream. And Peter and John on the way to prayer. Suddenly step into this man's life. You see, if I was to put that Maslow's law up again, we see this, the physiological needs. We understand in the scripture that God is our Jehovah Jireh. He's the one who provides all our needs. He's our safety and our security. He's the God who leads us, the protector, our shield, the one who fights for us. Our love and belonging needs in our life. God is love. He's the father. The church is a family. Self-esteem. God who formed us uniquely and wonderfully is a God who knows us intimately. And then the self-actualization is not self-actualization. It's God revelation. God who reveals his plan and his purposes in our lives. And the beggar, he was saying, meet my physiological needs. And Peter and John says, we don't have any silver and gold to give you, but God is about to transform your whole life. What do I have in my hands? What do I have? What do you have tomorrow? You know, I think sometimes we answer similar to Peter and John, but we answer with a different spirit to Peter and John. Sometimes we say, I can't really help your situation, but I'll pray. I'll pray. If I can say on that, if the number of times the Christians made a commitment to pray, if they actually did pray, then I think things would change. I'll pray for you. You know, I, I want to encourage you when you're in the middle of a conversation with someone and they share their need, don't say, I'll pray about that. Pray about it. Yeah. There and then. Yeah. Say, okay, I'm going to do that. Do you mind if we pray now? While well, we're in the middle of a cafe. Oh, sorry, I forgot. God doesn't do cafes. Oh, how terrible of me to forget that. We're in the middle of a high street. What do you mean, shall we pray? Oh, God is everywhere. And if you believe he could change them, why would you wait for another day, another day, another appointment? Pray now. Come on, let's have a church at the end of all our gatherings together. And as you're talking over coffee and I've got a difficult time, can I pray? Don't say, hey, have you spoke to the pastor? He'd love to pray with you. She'd love to pray with you. Pray. Be a people of prayer. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. Praying for you is all too easy an offer of comfort, but it's not meant to be a comforting term. It's meant to be an expression of I'm going right to the top of the authority structure in the universe, and I am going to pray. I'm going to bring this right into the Holy of Holies, and I believe that God has the ability and the power to change everything from that place. I'm not going to go and speak to a hearsay person. I'm going right to the top. The one who has all authority. The one who, there is no rival, there is no equal. Some of you are very intimidated by the enemy, and he is not Jesus' evil twin brother. He is a created being. Jesus is the authority of all authorities. And the church comes alive when we know the authority that Jesus has, and we know that he's invested that in his people. We're namby-pamby around a whole bunch of stuff in Christianity. And God is saying, church... I have placed all authority in you. Go and reveal me to the world. Prayers of faith are the most powerful force on earth. They can shift situations. They can open doors. They can transform lives. Where are the men and women of faith today? I see them. I see you. Maybe you haven't realized it yet. Maybe you're not living out of the revelation. But I see you. I see faith dormant in some of your hearts. Inadequately hidden because you think I'm not really a spiritual person. God's not looking for spiritual people. He's looking for people who know what it is to walk with him in their daily life. And for people that will rise up and say, I believe my God can do that. 
Thank God for praying women throughout history. But guys, we've got to pull our socks up. We've got to rise up, guys. Prayer has become the domain of powerful praying women. And I think some of us guys, let me tell you what this goes to the heart of, because we want to fix things, guys, don't we? You know, we don't want to, when our wife comes in and says, oh, the car's broken down, we don't want to put her armor on and give her a counseling session about a disappointment. We want to get out there and fix the car, don't we? You know, we like to fix things. We like to sort things out, roll our sleeves up, fix the problem. And prayer just feels a little passive if you think it's a term of comfort. But if you know that it's the most fix-it thing you can do, then you will rise up and you will say, family, family, come on, gather around now. Come on. Something's happening and we're not going to allow this to happen on our watch. Come on, man, rise up. Know your authority. It's difficult because not only do we think it's a term of comfort, mistakenly, but there is something that it requires us, guys, to die a little bit as well. Well, not a little bit, a lot. Because the fixing is not because of what we know, but it's because of who we know. And that is humbling for us, guys, who like to be the people who fix things. Look at me, guys. The best way you can fix anything is by knowing the one who can fix everything. And knowing that he has invested that authority in your life and you can rise up. There's an army of men arising and women. Please, you know my heart. Sorry to make it sound like I'm going for the guys. I am going for the guys. Come on, stop being so passive, guys. Stop needing entertainment. Stop needing sport to be the thing that's your passion. Just allow the heart of God to rise up and be mighty warriors. Warriors in the kingdom. But ladies, please don't, don't hear me say that, you know, the guys are the only ones who rise up with this authority. We believe, we believe in women of God rising up. We believe... Men and women, God has made us to need each other in the body of Christ. And when we rise together in that authority, I believe magnificent things happen. What do I have? He takes him by the hand. Holds him. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he pulls him up. Lifts him up. You know, when we pray prayers of faith, there is an action that's required. That's why often when we pray for someone who's unwell, I say, what couldn't you do before and why didn't you begin to do it? Just step out now. Try and do something. Because the word precedes the step of faith. And it says that his ankles became strong. When did that happen? Did it happen when he began to pray? Did it happen when he held his hand? Did it happen as he began to stand up? Well, it seems if the text is in a chronological order, that it was when he began to, stood up, began to stood, stand up. I don't know that for definite, but I do know in my life that most of the times that I see the breakthrough, it's when I've already made a decision to step out for God, to stand up for him. To take a risk with my life for something that, to be honest, if God doesn't come through, I'm going to fall back down and I'm going to be in a worse position than I was previously. We are committed in this church to standing up with words of faith in our life. To trust the Lord will open the doors and make all things possible. Do you know, on November the 10th, you should mark this in your diary. November the 10th is a Friday night. Let me tell you why you should mark this in your diary. Because we believe that the Lord has invited us to call believers from all across the Southwest to gather. We believe there could be between 2,500 and 4,000 people. And we've hired the West Point Arena for a night of prayer. And we're just working on a strategy to get that out to believers. It's not going to have Rediscover branded all over it. It's not a big Rediscover thing. 
But we have stepped out. Do you know the cost of doing this? And please, we're always facing these sort of questions about you know, how open we are with our leadership. And I, I'll tell you everything, but um, you know, I, I need you to be aware when I do that. Some of you will think, oh, I shouldn't be spending all that money on that. And you know, I understand all of those things. But do you know to hold that one night of prayer, it's going to cost about 62,000 pounds. Do we have it? What do you think? Take it by the hand and stand by faith. And we don't just do that with any idea that comes to our mind. We do it with the things we believe the Lord is revealing. And as a team, we met the other week after considering this and praying about it, and we chatted around it, and we came to a consensus together that it fell right with us and right with the Spirit. And then we step out. What's your event? What's your, what's your need? What's your miracle that needs to be put into motion? It's got to be acti- activated to close. I'm going to show you a four and a half minute video. A video that was foundational for my teenage years because I was there at this meeting. It's a bit grainy, it's old technology, but it was at the National Exhibition Center in Birmingham where 12,000 believers were gathered. Reinhard Bonke was the guest preacher. And there was a lady that got out of a wheelchair. Just watch this, would you? Jean had had this dream that was, she told us this, there was going to be a row of wheelchairs and she was going to be healed. She went believing she was going to be healed. We didn't know what to expect, but when Reinhard Bonnke went to her and mm. prayed for her, it, it, it was wonderful. And I just could not believe that there I was staring at the same man that was in my dream. And I knew then, I had no doubt that something was going to happen of some sort. And the very place, the, the black floor, the red seats I had described, it was just there. West German evangelist Reinhard Bonker was ministering. Jean Neal was sitting in her wheelchair off to one side of the auditorium. When time came for prayer for the sick, it happened just as in Jean Neal's dream. He then literally ran to where Jean Neal was sitting in her wheelchair. After laying hands and praying for her, he told her to get up and walk. And I remember when Reinhardt went up to her, straight up to her, and prayed for her, and she got out of that, we were looking out of that chair, and she ran around. to you praise God now isn't that did you witness this how many saw this praise God pardon my husband's come and seen it now tell me what was wrong with you spine trouble for 50 25 years 25 years spine trouble 25 years spine trouble now look at this. Do you mind to come up, come up, come up the platform? Just tell us what Jesus has done. Isn't that terrific? I would like you to look at what is your name? G. G. Mrs. G. Neal. You are the husband? Yes, John. You pushed your wife? Yes. Now your wife will push you. Thank you. Hallelujah! 
Isn't that terrific? You know, I'll tell you the truth, Gene. When I came in here and I saw you there, the Holy Spirit said to me, that woman will be healed tonight. I say that before God. Let's just stop it there. And when I came from... I, I was there at that event. I was 15 years of age. And I still remember to this day, God, our world is full of people that need the church to take them by the hand and say, get up and walk. I'm not talking just about physical illness. I'm talking about the marginalized. I'm talking about those who have no hope. I'm talking about those who have nothing in their life compared to what God can do. And I believe God is raising up his church in these days to be faith-filled people. Would you stand with me? Oh, Jesus. If you have children, you probably need to go and pick them up. Sorry, it hasn't finished before you need to do that. But there's not a methodology, there's not the words you say, but it's the conviction that we carry of the authority that is within us. God has called us, he said, you are the light that brings light to the world. I thought that was who Jesus was. But he has shared his light with us. This is the first time we read post-Jesus' ascension of a specific miracle, although there were others before this. I'm sure that community, as that man walked into the temple, walking, leaping, leaping. I bet he was leaping. This guy had never walked in his life and now he's leaping. Oh, Jesus. Lord, would you break those things that are keeping people confined? Lord, would you break drugs over this nation? It's keeping people away from hope and life. Can't even lift their heads because of the shame in their life. God, would you break that over our nation? Oh, Lord. The enemy has done such a job at holding people in, confining them in, keeping them away from liberty. And Lord, you've called us to be your people, to go into all the world and to announce this is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year of freedom for the captives. This is the year of recovery. This is the year, oh God of you liberating those who have been held by the clutches of the enemy. Lord, you're asking us to hold out our hand and to pick people up and say in Jesus' name, rise up. Just while individuals make decisions about what this week looks like if you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus I have to tell you you will never find anyone that will satisfy your life like Christ it doesn't make everything perfect it doesn't take away all of your troubles but you know that Jesus is with you in them and if you've never given your life to him I'm going to pray a simple prayer and I'm going to invite you to say this prayer out after me and it goes like this maybe everyone else can join in to encourage those who will be saying it for the first time. Jesus, we thank you that you gave your life on the cross for me. I'm sorry that I've left you out. And I've done my own thing. And I've tried to fix my own needs. But today, I look to you and I say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please fill me with your love and your spirit that I might follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.